Hey, good morning, everyone. So good to be here today. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us from one of our four other campuses, or if you're joining us online, it's so good to be here today. My name is Levi. I serve as the campus pastor here in Greece, and um, before we get into this week's sermon, I want to personally invite you to Together Day. Uh, Together Day is a once a year opportunity for us to come together, not as one church in five locations, but one church in one location. Uh, We're going to be meeting together July 31st at Houghton College as Crosstown Alliance. And I'm really excited about that. I don't know if you guys are excited about that. I want to... I want, to, I want to personally invite you, and the thing that I'm most excited about is this. We're going to have people from all of our worship teams at every single campus represented up on stage leading us in worship together. This is like a once-a-year opportunity, and so if you're not planning on going, I would challenge you, put it on your, put it on your calendar. I'm also excited, the Greece campus, you guys right here in front of us, you guys have never been and I, I would just implore you, I just ask you, just make some time and do it and go. We are not doing services at all the other campuses. They're going to be closed up, and we're all just meeting at Houghton College. So we're going to do the service at 1030. Service will start at 1030, a little bit different than normal. Then we're going to have lunch together in the cafeteria and, and games and fellowship out on the quad. So make plans to go. You guys can carpool, do whatever you have to do to get to Houghton College on July 31st. That's the announcement. That's the kind of the housekeeping thing. Um, let's get into the sermon this week. We, uh, we've been going through the book of James, learning from the half-brother of Jesus about how to live a life of faith, faithful, how to live a life of faith. And I know I don't always get the chance to preach, and so I'm thankful and grateful for the opportunity, especially to be preaching to all the other campuses as well. And I'd like to take some time to maybe tell you a little bit about myself. And one thing you guys should know is that I am not very athletic. You guys could probably guess that. I'm not, I'm not an athletic person. I've never been athletic throughout school, but I did do one sport. You know what it was? It was baseball. And I started at T-ball, then I did Pee-wee, and then I did Little League, and then I did Modified. Took a little break in high school when the balls started going really, really fast. But I got back into it as an adult. I joined the big leagues, and I did church softball for a few years. And if it's one thing I've learned about baseball, it's this. When you go and you step up to the plate and you begin to swing, you have to follow through. You guys know what I'm talking about? You can't just get up to the plate and be all kind of scared like I was. You can't be afraid of the ball. You have to follow through with your swing, or else you're not going to be able to hit the ball the right way. But follow-through has more application than just baseball. Follow-through is a principle of life. Follow-through is when you do what you say you're going to do. It's when your actions actually line up with your intentions, right? It's when you practice what you preach, right? It's when you say you value family, and then you put family days on the calendar, and then you go and you do those family days, right? It's when you say you're going to mow the lawn and the lawn gets mowed. It's when you come up with a workout plan and you put the plan to work. You have to have follow through. Now, as we've been learning through the book of James how to live a life of faith, James tells us what kind of faith he's looking for. What kind of faith does a Christian have? Well, it's a faith that follows through. It's a follow-through faith. So, we're going to be in James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. This is what it says. Know this, my beloved brothers. Know this uh, literally means to to take note of this, like, like commit it to memory. Make sure you're paying attention. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The first thing that James tells us, in order to have a follow-through faith, we need to be quick to hear. The Greek word uh, here is, um, is the word akuo, which literally means to hear, to listen, to understand. I like this, to pay attention to, right? Like, there's a difference between 
just like kind of hearing where it goes in one ear and out the other. I don't know if I'm preaching to the choir. I don't know if that ever happens to you guys where it goes in one ear, out the other. That happens to me a lot. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about leaning in. We're talking about listening with the intent to understand or to pay attention to. The first step to having follow through with your faith is leaning in and listening. You got to be you got to be a listener is what James is essentially saying. Be a listener. We've got a lot of hearers in the room today. I'm sure we've got a lot of hearers at our other campuses where you you come to church and you listen to the sermon. Uh, We don't know what happens with that sermon. We don't know if it goes in and out. I don't know. But a faith that follows through is one that leans in, maybe takes some notes. But you're seeking to understand what the word is saying and how you can apply it to your life. Being quick to listen requires us to have some humility, not thinking that we know it all already. Not, like it requires us to kind of empty our mind of some preconceived ideas so that there's room for more, right? It's approaching God's word with a sense of saying, God, I know that there's something you have for me, something I don't have already. I need more, and I'm receptive, and I'm going to receive what it is you want to say to me. So be quick to listen. Secondly, The word says be slow to speak. Slow to speak. Why? Because the thing that will keep you from listening is speaking. The thing that will keep you from hearing what God is trying to say to you is speaking too soon. I like this, the old adage that says, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them accordingly. That is wisdom, right? You do the math. We should be listening much more than we should be talking. Or uh, I like this, the quote from Jesus, son of Syrac, not Jesus of Nazareth, a a different Jesus, Uh, he said, be swift to hear the word that you may understand. If you have understanding, answer your neighbor. If not, lay your hand upon your mouth. Be quick to listen and be slow to speak. And then thirdly, it says, be slow to get angry. And I think there's two main applications to to, to this, be slow to get angry. The first one is kind of found in the context of the whole, of the whole chapter and where, where, where James is saying, count it all joy, brothers, when you, when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, endurance, a sense that, so that you would be complete and mature, meaning there are trials that God brings about in our lives to produce in us a sense of maturity so that we would grow in our faith. But as we learned last week, there's a temptation to say, God, you must be bringing this into my life because you're not good or you don't know what's going on or you're not in control. It's a temptation when we fear, when we face trials of many kind, when we face trouble, when we, when we hit, get hit with loss or grief or, or sadness. We can be quick to get angry at God and not let the trial do its work. See, it says that the trial is meant to produce steadfastness and endurance. Um, but, but what James says here is that the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Meaning, the trial won't actually do its work if you get angry and bitter. You will get bitter and you will not get better. So we can get angry with God when trials come our way. And secondly, we can get angry when we open up the book. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever opened up the book and, it, and you read a passage and you're like, wow, that really kind of hurts, right? It like, it like starts to speak into your life a little bit, maybe an attitude that you have or a, or a behavior, a habit that's in your life and it speaks to it and you, you kind of get convicted then you just, you're quick to just get, get offended and shut the book and not, not want to do anything with it, right? That happens to us sometimes. Why does that happen? It happens because we believe that this book is not just a man book, not a book written by men. We believe that this is the word of God. And if it's the word of God, it means that it's authoritative. It, 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 it has authority. It claims authority over our lives. So when we read the book, it requires us to do something with it. It's authoritative. But the thing is, there's something deep inside of all of us that wants to be our own authority That we want to be in the driver's seat of our own life. We want to call the shots. We want to have it our way. And when we come face to face with this book that doesn't lie, 
that comes with authority, and we read it. And sometimes we can get angry, we will get bitter, and we will not get better. And James says in verse 21, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Go back one more, Dan. That word put away literally means to take off. Like you're taking off dirty clothes. I've got a brother-in-law. He's a diesel mechanic. If you know anything about diesel mechanics, you know that their clothes get filthy. They're oily, they're greasy, they're just, they're grimy. And so he has a rule in his house that he's not allowed to go in the house until he takes off all of his clothes because he doesn't want to get anything in the house dirty. Just like that image, James is saying, just like dirty clothes, take off the filthiness and the rampant wickedness and receive. You notice the progression. It goes from putting away or taking off to receiving with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Meaning, there is a connection between what you do with the word of God, whether you act on it, and whether you receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Meaning this, that maybe sometimes the thing that actually keeps us from receiving the word of God is the fact that we didn't do anything last time we opened up the book. That we didn't do anything last time we heard the sermon. We didn't act on last week's message. And so it has a cumulative effect where when we open up the book, we are not able to receive what it is God is trying to say. Then we go on to verse 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving Yourselves. James says that if all you ever do is hear the word and you don't do it, you actually deceive yourself. You lie to yourself. You trick yourself. If your faith doesn't have any follow-through or action, you deceive yourself. And, she, and he compares it to like a man who looks in the mirror. This is what he says. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once he forgets what he was like. Now, at first glance, it would seem like this man is like any other man who looks at the mirror, says, I look good, and goes away and forgets and doesn't really do anything about it. But he's not just like any other man. He's a man who looks intently at himself in the mirror. This man's more like a teenage girl looking at the mirror, right? Like you look intently and you see every little blemish, every little spot, every little hair that's out of place. And so he's looking at the mirror. The the word intently literally means to consider or to stoop down. Like when Jesus says, consider the birds or consider the lilies, he's, he's saying he actually looks intently to understand And he sees the hairs that are out of place. He sees the the pimples that need to be popped. He sees the beard that needs to be trimmed. He sees all the stuff, and yet he chooses to do nothing with it. And he goes away, and he forgets what he looks like. The Bible is like a mirror. And, And when we open it up, it doesn't lie. It's, it's like a magnifying glass of the heart. And it shows you the way things really, truly are. We come face to face with reality. Specifically, we come face to face with how much we fall short. It's a mirror. And it shows us ourselves. That's why when you hear a message, sometimes you think that the, the preacher is speaking right to you directly, like if, if, as if you were the only one in the room. That's why you can open up the Word of God and have immediate application for your life that very day. No matter what the Word is saying, you can have immediate application for your life. I like the way the author of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews 4, uh, verse 12. He says, for the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The Bible 
actually judges not just the appearance of things, but it judges your motives and your attitudes and your heart. So, what James is essentially saying, don't be just a hearer, but be a doer as well. Don't look at yourself in the mirror and forget what you look like. Look at the mirror, take some inventory, and take action. I think the reality is most of us want a transformed life. We want a changed life. Right? I, I think most of us want to grow in our faith with God. But the thing is, we don't just get better. We don't actually get a transformed life by sitting in a worship service and just allowing it to go in one ear and out the other. We, we don't live a transformed life when we open up the Word and we just check the box of Bible reading. At some point, we need to get to work. Same reason you don't get in shape by reading a workout plan. If that was the case, I would be in a lot better shape than I am. It's the same reason we don't make a wonderful meal by looking at a recipe. At some point, you got to get some dishes dirty and get to work, right? I remember uh, a f- last month, our neighbors uh, contacted us and said, hey, we just bought a swing set off Amazon, and we need some help putting it together. And so they had a box, it came in the mail, it had the instruction manual, it had the swing set, it had all the, like, the pieces, the brackets, the hardware, all that stuff. And they really wanted to build a swing set, but they didn't really know how to go about doing it. So I, I, I'm not that handy, but I, I grabbed my toolbox, I came over, and, and, and we started putting it together. We, we read the instruction. It said that this piece goes in here, and that piece goes in there, and then this screw goes in that thing, and then, and then all of a sudden you have a, a swing set, Right? You have to get to work. But being a hearer and not a doer would be like reading the instructions and telling your kids, go have fun. Reading the instructions, pointing at the box and saying, have at it. How disappointed would they be? At some point, you have to get to work. And I want to say, I think right now would be a great spot for me to just say a disclaimer. That what I'm not talking about is works-based salvation. It could be really easy to look at that and just think, I just got to do better. I got I to gotta do more good things than bad things. And God's going to look on me with favor and save my soul. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. As my good friend Bob says, we're not saved by faith and works. We're saved by a faith that works. A faith that follows through with action. I like uh, how 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 puts it. All scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching. Another translation says useful for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And then the next verse says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This book is not just an academic textbook. We can't treat it like a history book. We can't treat it like just a science book. We have to open it up and allow it to shape the way that we live. It's a doing book. Verse 25 says this, "But But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed. In his doing. I love how James calls it the law of, go back uh, one more, Dan. He calls it the law of liberty. I think most of us, when we look at a law, when we look at this book, we see it sometimes as a list of do's and don'ts, things that we should do, things that we shouldn't do. But you can see with the language of James, he says, he calls it the law of liberty, like freedom. Meaning, this isn't just the, the shackles and bondage of, of trying to do more good things and, and trying to be a better person and just trying to, trying to earn your way to God. No, he's saying this is the law of freedom. This is not a burden. This is a pleasure. This is a joy. This is someone who's actually coming from a transformed heart, someone who has a relationship with the Lord. And he says this is the law of liberty. And it's not called a law of liberty because it doesn't constrain you. It does constrain you. 
It does. It calls out, like, this is the way to go. This is the way you shouldn't go. This is sin. This is life. This is bad. This is good. It constrains your life, but this is what it constrains you from. It constrains you from the things that will ultimately enslave us. It will, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. This book is the way to life and a full, abundant life. It's the law of liberty. And then in verse 26, James goes on to say, if anyone thinks he's religious, I think this is an interesting word. This word actually isn't used very much in the Bible. This is one of the only places in Scripture where this word is used. It says he is religious, and uh, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And then in verse 27, it says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Keep in mind here that James is writing to, uh, he, he actually addresses this letter to the 12 tribes, meaning uh, it's another way of saying Jewish people. So he's talking to Jewish converts who are experiencing persecution and trouble. Now, the thing we need to understand about Jewish people is that they knew a lot about religion. They knew a lot about religion obedience to the law. And they, had, they actually had 613 commandments, some of which were moral laws, some of which were ceremonial laws, meaning they were tradition. They were what to do on certain days, what types of food they could eat, and what kinds of clothes that they could wear. So they were very good at keeping those things. But what James is talking about is he's saying you need to have a faith that follows through. You have to have a religion that follows through. If you think you're religious, but your, your actions actually don't line up, that's a problem. Now, in the church today, a lot of evangelical churches, even in our church, we, we say it's not about religion, right? We say that. It's not about religion. It's about what? A relationship, right? It's about a relationship with God. It's not just about the, like going to church on Sunday. It's not just about uh, you know, bringing your Bible and, and, and reading it every day. It's not just about those outward things. It's about a relationship. But here's the reality. Everyone has a religion. Each one of you has some set of practices that demonstrate your faith. So if faith is inward, your religion is going to be outward. So everyone has a religion. And what James is trying to get at is don't let your religion be a religion of hypocrisy. Which unfortunately is what the church is kind of known for outside of these walls. You know, just being a bunch of hypocrites, not practicing what they preach, not bringing their actions in line with their intentions and their motives. And some of that is well-deserved. Well some of it is well-deserved. So what... James is calling out is, is two things primarily. One, he says if you, if you can't bridle your tongue, right? A bridle, if you've ever worked with horses, you know that a bridle is a piece of headgear that's used to control um, horses. And so you can get them to move and, and do whatever you want them to do as long as you have a bridle. I stay far away from horses. I don't have anything to do with them. But, but ho like a bridle, meaning you can control. If you can't bridle, can't get a grip, can't Get, have some self-control over the things that come out of our mouths. And he says, your religion is worthless. That's like some strong language. And, and, and I would even put it into today's language. If, if we can't put a bridle on our phones, can't get a bridle on our thumbs and on the things that we type, some of the things that we post on social media, can I get an ouch or an amen, anything? Sometimes we, we just, we got to have some self-control about how, how, how we are perceived by those around us. saying it, it kind of hurts your witness, makes you look like hypocrites. And then he says, the, the other thing he says is that, that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is to visit widows, orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So it's not always the things that we do, the lack of self-control that we have. It's sometimes it's the things that we don't do that cause people to think we're hypocrites, Right? Religion that's pure, like caring for those that need it most. Caring for those who can't care for themselves. Caring for the vulnerable and the poor 
and the needy and the sick. So what James is getting at is two things. Sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission, like when you, when you, you do things that you're not supposed to do, right? You actively sin. You, you lie, you cheat, you steal, you commit adultery, something like that. But then there are sins of omission that he's talking about. When you don't do the things that you should be doing. You don't love your neighbor. You, you don't care for the sick. You don't feed the poor. You're like, like you just, you don't do those things. James is saying, if you want to call yourself religious, if you want to make that claim that you are a religious person, you better be concerned with personal purity and caring for those around you. I would say it this way, personal pur- purity and justice and mercy. I think that it's hard, it's hard to do this, guys. I, I think James is, is not pulling any punches here. It's, this is a hard thing to, probably should have said that at the beginning of this message. This, this is hard. It's hard to hear these things. But what he's saying is so true. And I know we don't always get this right, do we? Um, I think when we do get this right, this is something to be celebrated, something to be um, honored. And so I, I, I want to share a quick t- testimony of how our uh, church is doing this. Uh, they put these words literally, caring for widows and orphans, into practice. And so um, one of the things that a lot of our other campuses might not know, that uh, once a week, a handful of the people from our Greece campus go over to Hilton East Nursing Home, and they put on an entire church service for those folks there. A, a, a group of people who have kind of gone forgotten, especially in the, the season of COVID. They've, they've had a really rough go at it, and, and, and we've been in there every Saturday uh, doing a church service, teaching and, and singing, uh, doing songs, and they give them all these shakers and tambourines, and they, they have a lot of fun with it. And, and I think the biggest ministry that they offer is the, just the ministry of presence, just sitting there and being with those folks. Can we celebrate that today, church? Now, now that's, that's their thing. That doesn't need to be your thing, right? It, that doesn't need to be your thing. That's their thing. It's okay. But here's what I want to encourage you to do, that when we, when we open up this book, okay, I think this is, this is what a lot of us do, okay? We open up the book, and we do this. Flip, and we read it, and we flip, and we read, and we flip, and we just keep going and going and going and going and going and going and going. All right, let's not do that. Let's not do that. This is what we're going to do, right? We're going to read, we're going to stop, and we're going to ask God, what do you want me to do? We're going to open it up. We're going to read it. We're going to stop. We're going to wrestle with it. We're going to meditate on it. We're going to let it sink into our hearts. And then we're going to ask God, what is it that you want me to do? And then we flip and we read and we stop and we meditate and we wrestle and we get it into our hearts. And then we ask God, what is it you want me to do? Church, it's not easy to follow Jesus. James knows that. He's, he's saying you're going you're gonna to experience trials of various kinds. And he says what Jesus says a little bit later. This is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. The trial came, the suffering came, the the, the stuff in life, the loss came, the grief came, but it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. 
Church, you will endure hard times. You will endure suffering. You will endure trial. But you will not stand unless it's built on a foundation of a follow-through kind of faith. I took, uh, got these pictures up here. Flip to the first one. This is a sandcastle. This is beautiful. Right on Charlotte Beach, right down the road from the church. Um, this was a sandcastle that was built for Harbor Fest that took the guy five days to build. Five days. And he was asked by a reporter, he said, uh, they asked him, how can you put so much time and effort into something that's just going to get washed away? <laughs> and he said, well, it's, I'm a sandcastle builder. That's what I do. And not, all, not two weeks later, this is what it looked like. <laughs> Church, you're going to experience some tough things. You're going to experience wind and waves and rain and storms. We don't want to end up like this. So we're going to read. We're going to stop. We're going to meditate. We're going to wrestle. We're going to get it into our hearts and we're going to ask God, what is it you want me to do? And church, you know what? Even that won't be enough. <laughs> it's not going to be enough because at, the, at some point, you're going to ask God, what is it you want me to do? And you're going to go to try to do it. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to fail. You're not going to be able to do it. You won't, you won't have it in you. In your own human strength, you won't be able to do what God's asking you to do. Which is why Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If all we ever get out of this book is a list of do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, and we just try to live it out, we're going to fall on our face. We're just not going to be able to do it. We need a relationship with God. And that relationship, that abiding in the vine, being connected to Jesus, is going to give us the breakthrough that we need to actually live this thing out. Amen? This isn't just external rules that we follow. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament says that, that, that God replaces our hearts of stone. He, he puts in a heart of flesh. And he says he writes his, his laws on our hearts. Because at some point, you're not going to want to follow the workout plan. <laughs> you're not going to want to do the dishes and make the meal. And you're not going to want to get the box open and, and try to figure out how to build a swing set. The desire won't be there. What you need is a new desire. And God's word promises that he will give you the desires of your heart. And he's going to give you new desires. So what are we going to do? We're going to read. We're going to stop. We're going to meditate. And wrestle. Get the word in our heart. And we're going to ask God, what is it you want me to do? And then when we can't do it, we're going to lean back on Jesus. Amen? All right. Let's have all the worship teams come up at all of our campuses right now, and I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for your word. That it is alive and active. And God, I pray that you spoke specifically to each and every person listening today. That you cut, cut to the heart of the matter. God, that you, 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 you spoke to the inner person. And God, you brought words of conviction, words of life, and words of truth, Lord, that we would be able to walk and exercise and follow through on our faith. God, we are hopeless without you. So God, teach us how to abide in you and how to rest in you, to spend time in communion with you. Lord, that you would equip us and empower us for every good work. Lord, thank you for being what we couldn't, being faithful when we fall short. God, we look to you. Our faith is in you. In Jesus' name, amen.